Dr. Swick is the current medical director at uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals and is a former neurologist, or not a former, he is a neurologist, <laughs> who, who uh, ran a, a sleep clinic for many years and, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, was one of our, uh, our, our awake angels originally when we started the program a couple years ago with, I think it was Hurricane Irma, when we sent a couple hundred machines down to Texas for those patients that lost all theirs. So, uh, happy to have you back, and we're happy to learn a lot about the, the role that Erexin plays in, in uh, sleepiness, um, because we are a sleep apnea population and not a, not necessarily a narcolepsy first, and so this whole world is somewhat new to us, so any sort of education you could help give to our, our patients uh, would be gratefully uh, welcome, so take it away. Oh, thank you, Adam, and thank you, Justine, and thank you for the American Sleep Apnea Association for having me on. I've been listening to the uh, talk from the beginning, and my hat's off to you guys. This is a groundbreaking, cutting-edge presentation, and this is going to be the realm for many years to come, and I think you've just done a wonderful job. And I want to thank the uh, previous presenters. Uh, for laying the groundwork for what I'm going to be talking about today, because orexin is a neurotransmitter, it's also called hypocretin, that was just discovered 21 years ago. And it has enabled us to get a much better understanding of what allows us to wake up in the morning and conversely, how it changes over the course of the day, and how it allows sleep to come on. And there are illnesses, and Adam just mentioned one of them is narcolepsy, but it's sleep apnea. Orexin also plays a part. That's part of the research that is being done, not only uh, by Takeda Pharmaceuticals, but throughout the world in the role of orexin in regulating sleep and wakefulness. So, can I have my first slide? Let me get through the legal representations here. I'm an employee of Takeda Pharmaceuticals, uh, and Takeda is the sponsor of several preclinical studies and clinical trials of our agonists. And uh, the presentation is for your informational and educational uh, use. And we really are not referring to any drug that is approved by the FDA or any other regulatory agency for prescription use. Uh, all third-party research and information is clearly credited, and you will see the references on our slides. And if you have questions after this, I will not be taking questions, but you can get them through either the ASAA or through your healthcare provider. Next slide, please. As I said, this uh, neurotransmitter was discovered uh, and published by two, cent two centers, literally two weeks apart. One center was out in California. The other center was in Dallas, Texas. And that's why there are two names, by the way, orexin and hypocretin. But they're the same thing. They're the same compounds. And it is functional as a signaling molecule or neurotransmitter, meaning that it is produced in one part of the brain and has its actions elsewhere. Uh, a similar kind of compound would be a hormone, but this is within the context of the central nervous system. Now, the link between orexin and the control of wakefulness and sleep is really cutting-edge technology. And there have been uh, breakthroughs in how it controls wakefulness as well as sleep. And we know that uh, there are two different kinds of neurotransmitters in the orexin family that interact with two different receptors. A neurotransmitter and its receptor is very akin to a lock and key. The lock is the receptor, the key is the neurotransmitter. 
and you have to have the right key in order to activate the lock. And in this particular case, you need to have the right neurotransmitter in order to activate the right receptor. Orexin receptor type 2, OX2R, is the one that we think is the master controller of wakefulness, and it regulates REM and non-REM sleep. And the OX1 receptor mainly controls the reward centers of the brain and probably other physiologic functions that we really haven't quite uh, fully discerned at this point. And here you see in this cartoon pretty much how this works. The little pellets that you see traveling across the screen will activate the receptors as, again, those act, those act like keys into the lock. And then you see the effect where those signaling molecules are released by the nerves. And when they are released, wakefulness ensues. And in the top part, you see what happens as that little pellet enters that right configuration on the OX2R receptor, which allows the lock to be unlocked, and in this case, for the neurochemical to be released downstream. Orexin levels in the brain rise and fall, much like our circadian rhythms rise and fall as the day goes on. The dash line represents wakefulness, and there you see the sun. The red bar is the amount of orexin that is produced in the brain. And by the way, it is produced in a very small area of the brain called the hypothalamus. However, don't let that fool you because the amount of arborizations, meaning the amount of neurons that emanate from that hypothalamus, is one of the most extensive in the central nervous system with, with dendrites going into the uh, brain, the cortex, and down into the brain uh, brainstem. There you go. Now, so here you see the summary. During the day, you have high levels of orexin maintaining wakefulness, and at night, with that nice little crescent moon, you have a lower level of orexin, which is allowing sleep to ensue. And there you see the timing of the orexin changes over the course of a 24-hour time frame. This is a slide that has been alluded to in other talks. And um, what we have done, and we have looked at uh, mouse models. And uh, the next slide, I'll show you what we have seen in human uh, neuroimaging studies. But in the mouse model, which is the best way for us at this point to experimentally look at the effects of orexin on sleep and wakefulness, we are able to mimic different kinds of pathologic conditions. In one, we're able to maintain uh, chronic sleep deprivation by keeping the mouse awake. And during that time, we actually are able to demonstrate loss of orexin neurons in the brains of these um, experimental animals. If you lose those orexin neurons, you're going to lose that ability to maintain this neurotransmitter to promote wakefulness. And in its absence, what you're going to have is a net result of decreased wakefulness, increased sleepiness. The Intermittent short sleep, all of us who have sleep apnea, and I'm included in that, know that before I started CPAP, my sleep was terribly fragmented. Short periods of sleep punctuated by periods of wakefulness, and that's the paradigm that we were able to affect in this group of uh, experimental animals. And again, we were able to demonstrate loss of orexin neurons in the brains of these animals. So we're taking what we know to be human attributes in terms of uh, phenotypic symptoms and creating a mouse model and looking to see what changes that are affected in the brains of these animals. And you can see that there is significant findings. 
Then what we were able to do is using a compound that's an orexin-2 receptor agonist, meaning it is a drug that activates the orexin-2 receptor in both healthy and sleepy mice, we were able to get a generalized increase in wakefulness. So by activating these receptors and in both the sleepy mouse as well as the non-sleepy mouse, we were able to wake them up even further. And that is a very promising result, and that has allowed uh, Takeda to increase its a, uh, quest to find drugs that can do the same thing. Here you see a cartoon uh, cross-section of a human brain. And I want you to take a look at the LH, which stands for lateral hypothalamus. That's where the orexin molecules originate from. And the blue lines represent the neurons that are emanating from that lateral hypothalamus. And you can see it going up into the cerebral cortex. And if you take a look, there are some shorter blue arms that are going down into the brainstem. That's important because in order to wake up, you have to wake the brain up. That's the cerebral cortex. And you have to maintain a high degree of persistent wakefulness, which comes from stimulating cells in the brainstem, which are responsible for the maintenance of wakefulness. And there you see uh, the dorsal rafa nucleus and the pedunculo pontine tegmental nucleus, locus ceruleus, and an area above the brain stem, uh, also in the hypothalamus, close to where the orexin cells originate, is something called the tuberomamillary nucleus. All of these red circles are centers of the brain and brain stem that are responsible for keeping us awake. So what we are hypothesizing is that the orexin, which is coming out of the lateral hypothalamus, is keeping the cortex awake and maintaining the activation of these specific sites in the brainstem to maintain wakefulness throughout the day. So to summarize, we believe that orexin is the master regulator of sleep and wakefulness. I typically call it the master conductor. When a conductor raises his baton, the orchestra increases its volume and intensity. And that's the equivalent of wakefulness. When the conductor lowers his baton, the orchestra gets far more quiet and he can stop the music. And that's with sleep. And that's how I kind of analogize the erection system. And the erection levels in the brain are higher during the day and lower at night, as we demonstrated on that cartoon. And how this relates to sleep apnea is this third bullet point. And we have said that new scientific studies are investigating the role of erection to help with residual daytime sleepiness. And you heard a wonderful lecture uh, from Dr. Hyman about the fact that EDS is a very common uh, symptom in patients with OSA. And we know that there is a substantial proportion of patients who are adequately treated with things like CPAP who continue to experience daytime sleepiness. And we are trying to find ways to mitigate that daytime sleepiness. But the one caution I want to add here is that even when we find medicines to treat that residual daytime sleepiness, it does not negate the fact that CPAP still needs to be used to produce the opening of the airway, which is the necessary component of treatment of sleep apnea. And with that, I want to thank you for your time 
And I want to say that this is just an incredible way to learn. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Adam. We appreciate the the work that you've done for us, Dr. Swick, and we appreciate the education. Uh, I'm sure we'll be doing a lot more of this as we go because I think the the education factor uh, and, and our ability to translate this from 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 your guys' vocabulary, especially at, at a high end level as, as neurology, uh, down into a, a layman's terms. I always say if I can't explain it to my daughter, I don't understand it myself. <laughs> so <clears throat> this has been, uh, I think, a really good introduction for our community about excessive daytime sleepiness earlier with Dr. Hyman and about the role of Erexon that, 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 that you presented here. And I think it'll, as we continue to use our CPAPs and our, and, our, and our behavioral change and work on our nutrition and all these other things, we're really going to be able to start to figure out what's the right combination of, of therapies for sleep apnea patients. So with that, thank you so much. We will see you next time. There will be a next time. 